Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor and it's a pleasure for me to give this talk today. Uh, and I would like to explain and show you a little bit about my experience in audio processing and, uh, well, have entitled my talk with a simple nickname. <laughs> DAFX, not Daft Punk. No, we were earlier. And uh, I will talk not about, well, specific areas from the past. I would like to show you something uh, what we did very recently. And uh, that's my main uh, contribution today. So, my outline is showing you what we are going through. I will give an introduction into what I did in the past to give you an idea why I was able to work on different topics. And the topics I will be explaining today is, I will tell you how AMP modeling can be done or is done. That's a nonlinear processing approach which will be used later on in a very recent work, uh, which is on sound synthesis, which just came around the corner by surprise. I didn't want it to do anything about in that area. <laughs> uh, but it turned out that it has to be done somehow in a different way. In between is upmixing, which is a topic which we have worked ab about some time. And finally, we can use both techniques also to, well, make better sound synthesis kind of schemes, which I will also present finally. So, as Philip already mentioned, I've made lots of contributions. <laughs> That's my social media contribution, so to speak, down there in the line. Uh, you can use that for lots of applications straight out of the box without reinventing the wheel. And then you can extend from there and produce your own kind of contributions to that field. I will, we're not covering topics of these books there. The topics I will show are quite recent. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, I have 35 slides. Every slide <laughs> tells a long story. So I have to take care uh, to proceed properly. So first, my background. As Philip mentioned, I got my degree in 85, and then I was hired by a company from the south of Germany. The company is called Lavo. They build large-scale mixing consoles. And that's a piece from that time. Uh, it's a control interface. And all processing is done at a different place in very dedicated uh, hardware scenarios. That's the side view of that mixing console. That's not a live console for sound production. It's a console for the German broadcasting station, which has an evening kind of uh, news, which is called Daily Show, Tagesschau. And they need such kind of <laughs> large console just for producing that uh, use uh, recording and transmission. That's the control part, so it's 85, just faders and central control units. This was uh, a very innovative approach during that time. The signal processing during that time was done on such kind of card here. I'm sorry, I will walk a little bit. This is one meter times one meter. And it's one stereo channel. The control computer for controlling everything here is up there. It was based on an 1886. So, and these racks just having two channels are mounted in such kind of carriers. So this piece here is occurring 
here, 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 second stage, <laughs> etc. So quite big approach. But I was happy to jump into such kind of company during that time and to be able to start research for that company towards digital solutions. And this is an intermediate step from the early 19th. It's a recording studio and transmission studio for television in Berlin. Uh, during that time, we already had DSPs running uh, in such kind of racks, but now the cards are much smaller. Uh, you see these cards there, double euro format, and we had four DSPs on each card running eight channels of audio. So compared to that one square meter one, a quite significant reduction. Okay, and these, they were also housed in such kind of rooms, which you all know now are occurring in every scenario. So this was first company, second company, and then <laughs> I was asked to do something by myself, and I built the first interface for the former Elises ADAT 8-channel track recorder. It has an optical output and input. The rest was analog. And I built with colleagues, I built an interface to get out of this optical stream AES EBU outputs and inputs. This was the BFC-8, and the name for my work was ZIP. Uh, I also built with colleagues a mixing module, an 8-channel one, 8-channel sampling rate converters, meters, etc. This was early 90s when I did that. So I'm used to build hardware. <laughs> and I don't get into fear or trouble doing that. Okay, that's the, let's say, uh, professional product part of my background. Uh, after doing that, I was, of course, forced to go somehow towards the academ academic uh, field. And since 99, I'm, well, heavily teaching uh, I teach signals and systems. I teach communication systems, digital filters, multimedia signal processing. This means audio and video processing. And I'm still giving a course on digital audio signal processing. So these courses are given per year. I have three trimesters to teach. So it's really a lot. I'm doing there. But I can tell you that most of my personal inventions, which are made over the years, were completely based on foundations. And knowing the foundations of everything pretty well gives you, well, the background to be creative and to invent something new. If you don't know these basics, you will be just the player of some game but you won't do something new. So what we will see later on is based on deep knowledge, teaching everything every day, <laughs> explaining it to students. And if you're able to explain it to students, then you're also able to expand what you did in the past. That's my personal message over my past years or decades. <clears throat> so. That's my introduction into who I am and what I'm doing and what is the basic criteria for being ready to jump into such kind of areas, which we'll be talking about. So the first thing which I was interested in from the very beginning when I started studying with 20 after military service, we came, became, of, of course, interested in how do these tube amps or wave amps work properly? And these amps look pretty old-fashioned, uh, built in the 50s, 60s, 
and were based on just taking existing technology and tweaking around. So just uh, what I learned from Vassan Fafai, misuse of technology. <laughs> and they have been tweaked to a certain extent uh, that musicians were ready to use them and, uh, well, uh, define their signature tunes with them. So we started doing amp modeling by, well, of course, taking a close look into the main building blocks of such kind of amps. There's a preamp up front to adjust the guitar signal towards the rest of the chain of such kind of amp. There's a, especially in that preamp, there's already, well, nonlinear things happening. Uh, you see the input, and after the preamp, the first kind of uh, distorted positive part, quite heavily compared to the negative part. There's a simple EQ, which is also based on 35, or let's say from the 30s or 40s. Uh, there's a so-called phase splitter, which just takes the signal and inverts it, delivers two output, outputs. Uh, followed to two power amps, and then an output transformer combines both, both positive and negative parts to deliver the output to a speaker. And as you see there, after the output transformer, it looks pretty much like a square wave, uh, with, of course, some details, which makes the difference between different amps. And then finally, that kind of signal goes to a speaker, cabinet and it's then transferred via your transmission sound propagation through air. A short piece. <laughs> can create quite authentic kind of emulations of all things based on such kind of block-based approach. If you are able to measure inside uh, the amp and retrieve signals out of that areas and uh, then do system identification techniques to model the nonlinearity properly, uh, the linear part properly, and then, well, measure the single tubes properly. This is quite tedious and takes a lot of time and it's still not solved completely. But you can get results with that quite, quite good and, well, convincing. There are different newer approaches now. One is called white box modeling. This takes the schematics and perform some kind of uh, well, simulation, like PSPICE is doing it, and it transfers the analog circuit into a state space representation in the digital domain. The state space equations are usually used for linear systems. This is the lower part there of that signal flow graph. And, but you can include nonlinearities in there that's the upper part of the mid kind of signal flow graph, and then turn this into equations. So that's called white box modeling, and it's done by several people around the world. Also with us, it's Martin Holtus who tries to solve this problem, which makes things much easier, uh, but computational complexity is quite high for doing it with such kind of approaches. But with that kind of approach, you can analyze your circuit more properly uh, than one expects. But uh, it's necessary to be able to do that. Another approach is called gray box modeling. This approach uses the actual system and uses input-output measurements to derive, well, somehow measurement signals, which then can be used to use a virtual analog modeling scheme where you need a digital model down there. And then you 
try to use that digital model and to train the parameters of that digital model properly. This works pretty well and can be used to model each kind of AMP, stomp box, nonlinearity quite well. Well, how can you evaluate such kind of AMP model? Well, what we are doing there is we take the reference signal from the original, uh, from the original AMP, perform short and Fourier transform with that block size and hop size, like that, do some post-processing, and we do the same thing with the model output and then build a different signal. That's the residual there. And the residual is analyzed by a semitone filter bank. And then the sum of the residuals of each individual bands are summed up, and the reference is also split into several subbands. And then the quotient between the residual and the reference is taken, and a final score is given. So that's one score which you get out of such kind of psychoacoustic bin pooling and then building a final score. For those who are interested in that field, there's a recent publication by Felix Eichers who did that. It's in the December volume of the Audio Engineering Journal, where you will also find these graphs here. What you see here for the AMP evaluation is a rating. 100% is perfect, zero is down there. And here you see two measures. Uh, and these are subjective measures with these box graph plots there. And down here it's uh, low volume, clean, mid gain, mid volume, mid gain, high volume, high gain, high gain, uh, high volume. You see that from um, a listening test, uh, very low level distortion has a high rating. And if you go towards higher distortions, the rating gets worse. These are the box graphs which are shown. Up there, on the top, there are the so-called psychoacoustic ev evaluation of audio similarity scores. They are in green. And you see that these values getting out of math match pretty much the subjective evaluation there. So the P-score here goes down, uh, or goes up to 0.3, and the other amp starts pretty good and then gets worse. But for both amps, the results are quite, quite good and useful. Okay, so that's the part of amp uh, modeling and a way to evaluate it. Okay, so the next topic which we have been working on uh, was mono to stereo upmixing and even then use stereo upmixing for a higher number of channels upmixing. The upmixing process is done by splitting the input into a certain number of frequency bands. So you do a filter bank analysis and then you try to estimate direct components and surround components out of that frequency domain representation. And then you use, well, the direct components to repen them according to your multi-channel setup. And of course, you also take your surround extracted parts and repen them to, well, uh, such kind of multi-channel output scenario. So this is the approach we, we did with different kind of uh, approaches, uh, FFT-based, but also time domain-based things. They all work towards a certain extent and deliver such kind of results. So I have now several sound examples to, to show that. The first piece is just a club situation where we extracted the surround sound of, out of that one. And it's done in, in an iterative manner. It sounds like that. So first, 
the stereo and the club and the band and the people there. If someone can translate what they are talking, it would be nice. So, the band goes away. Now the band comes slowly back. And finally, the stereo mix a bit. So this was quite convincing in the very beginning, but uh, it took one person to work on it for three years to get much better, and that's the case for all kind of things I've been doing in the past, not only for these three algorithms. From my point of view, it takes about three persons, so around 10 years of work, to have something, something from first idea to something which is robust and is usable. So you can't do it with one PhD. You need three in a row or you have a team of people doing that. Everything below 10 years <laughs> is worth nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> I have, in the meantime, 23 PhDs, so I know what I'm talking about. So don't get disappointed if you just started your PhD. It's, it's your first contribution, so it's, everyone will welcome it. <laughs> the last example here is a stereo upmix to 5.1. And I would like to explain that first. What you see here is uh, a six-channel output here. The, the upper part is the front left. Then the second row is the front right. The third one is the center. The fourth one is the low frequency enhancement. And the last two are the surround left and right. So what I would like to show to you is that they are pretty different from each other. And you will also see all power spectrums running a long time here, that they are totally different. That's one thing. And what's shown down here will be the cross-correlation between front-left and front-right. So they should be decorrelated if you have a center speaker, because repenning is done between center and right and center and left. And that's what you will notice here. And I will just play back the stereo sound, because we don't have um, 5.1 setup here, and I don't even have an interface for that right now here. So the piece is a little bit wild, I call it, it's my office jam. And it sounds quite colored. It's not a perfect mix, it's an amateur kind of having fun. It shows that it's 
Well, it's a rough mix in stereo without taking care, just having fun. And then spreading this up towards 5.1. And I can tell you, 5.1 is much more fun than just listening to plain stereo. That's also something which I'm convinced of. You, if you are inside a car, <laughs> it's much more fun having 5.1 or any kind of channels, but have more than just two and use that. And if you're considering, well, headphone kind of reproduction in the future, it's much more fun having surround around your head than just sticking to your headphones and having everything inside the head. So these surround technologies will move into headphones, I'm pretty sure. And, well, if you have lots of stereo basics and even mono basics, you can spread it well, with such kind of techniques. Okay, that's the upmix side of the world, which was very interesting for us and uh, was yeah, challenging but rewarding as well. Okay, and now we also had to find some kind of evaluation for it. Uh, there are very few evaluations of upmix algorithms uh, and well, we did one paper, it's in Applied Science, 2017, performed by Martin Mead. He built up lots of tests for evaluating how good, well, the angle of a source can be estimated by such kind of uh, system, and then perform the difference measurement between uh, intended angle and measured value out of the algorithm. There are lots of tests, you can all find them there, uh, how to do that. And then for each test you have, you can derive a score, and here you see the number of tests we did. These are panning tests, direct signal tests, loudness tests, phase tests, etc. You see, we used uh, four upmix algorithms, and they all have a certain order that may differ from test to test. And then every score is finally weighted to give such kind of final result. So this was rewarding to see. Well, if it's, uh, if, how can we compare to the rest? and how can we compare to others. And maybe it's a discussion point for people in that field. But I know companies are involved, so things get tough. Okay, so the last part is about, well, multi-sign oscillators used, which can be used for sound synthesis. This is a quite interesting and um, Funny story, I did this multi-sign oscillator research a long time back. It was in 2010, so nine years back. And I tried to convince people making use of it. When do you think did I succeed in finding someone? Any suggestion? Ten years. <laughs> now this was shorter, it took eight years. So is it much more fun doing marketing than doing research with three PhDs? And I even contacted the big players in the field. And I got no feedback. Okay, that's good. But this <laughs> has led to going back to some people I know from um, an earlier product. And he asked me, well, do you have something for a specific application? And I said, no, I don't have something <laughs> for your desire right now. But I have something in my pocket which is worth doing it. And I convinced him to do it, and we did it together. And that's the result of what I will be showing you right now. It started two years back. So that's nothing. And what we did is, 
a multi-sign oscillator approach. It works like this. You can modify a sign oscillator to create higher harmonics. And you can choose the number of harmonics, and you can choose the slope of these harmonics here. And these slopes can be adjusted with infinite precision. You don't need 6 dB per octave slopes and move the cutoff frequency of these simple filters from the path back and forth. It's something like a multi-carrier signal, uh, which can be used also for data transmission. And the basic for this idea comes from baseband communication, how to transmit bits along a band-limited channel. And if you know that you need Nyquist pulses, yes, you have to design Nyquist pulses somehow. And that's what I learned and what I did. So this was only possible to do with my knowledge about pulse shaping for baseband transmission. And leads to that kind of spectrum. So, two years back, we started from scratch using that oscillator approach and our aim was just to build a new kind of synthesizer, not having in mind to emulate anything. Why should we emulate anything? Because it's there. Try to build something which can be used to do new things, and that's what we did. And that's the result. That's the promo of the company, that's Nectar. It gives you an idea of the quality. As you see, all sounds are based on that synth engine, even the drums. I'm so proud of it. The idea is back in 2010. Acquisition <laughs> took eight years. <laughs> and then building the product took two years, with the help of several people. And it sounds pretty decent, I would say. And it sounds different. Uh, well, check it out. Well, that's the control interface. It's pretty simple. It's, it's simple enough that I'm able to control it somehow. And I would like to explain to you what, what are the uh, kernel things happening there. So, it's not easy here on stage and also for you to note what's happening in different areas. So the first part is uh, oscillator one, and the specific part of that is that it just has um, a so-called harmonics knob. This is the number of harmonics you can create. Uh, the second knob, there's the roll-off knob. It controls the slope of the harmonics. You can even use just a fundamental and raise the harmonics up. Not being limited to 6 dB, 12 dB Butterworth designs. No, it's a filter which has continuously variable slope. And it, it has continuously variable number of harmonics. So that, these are the two main control buttons there. 
And there's a noise button there as well. Uh, then there are the obvious kind of uh, envelope controls. And one other important thing is there, there's a nonlinearity involved. That's the red uh, triangle there, which you can adjust to saturate what you're doing there. And this is done in that sequence. So there's the oscillator coming, then the nonlinearity is applied to that oscillator output. Then you apply your ADSR, your level control, and you can pan each oscillator. So pretty basic, but you can turn on your sound with just two knobs. We don't need a filter after that. I have to be careful not to make jokes now. And I stop <laughs> making something like that. So from that kind of oscillator, we have two with the same structure. And then both are summed up and run into the effects section down here. It's just an EQ with bandpass and peak filter, a chorus, a delay, and a reverb. Everything is controlled by simple buttons. Not everything is on screen. There are no hidden things happening there. So you have access, and you can have fun with your knobs and not do lots of other things. So the series of effects are down there. And then finally, there's a central control unit where you see the waveform, and if you click the waveform, you have the spectrum and can go back and forth. Uh, there are several further control knobs. You can do FM and cross-modulation between both. That's the basic signal flow graph of that synth engine. That was the main volume, and then there are, well, modulation envelope generators, which can be linked to four destinations here. And with that knob, you control the amount of what's happening there. And this modulation EG, EG works for both oscillators and influence all parameters there. The second modulator are three low-frequency modulators, also with the same kind of destinations, which you can choose and then adjust properly. And that's the synth. It looks pretty simplistic, but I can tell you, can, you can do sounds which, which you never did before. This was quite interesting to hear. And even from people who are in that business since a long time. I remember one YouTube video where one person said, Ooh, it's all synthesis. Just a small amount of memory or storage for that synth. And ooh, I have 100 synths, but this one sounds different. This was nice to hear. I'm so proud of that. Okay, so what's, what's the kernel heart of it is published uh, seven years back. And with that publication and the idea, I went around and I didn't succeed. Uh, last year, we had a publication at the DAFEX conference where Sebastian Kraft showed, well, some plots of that system. You see there, that's the multi-sinus oscillator output. It looks like sync functions, where you can control the slope and you control the number of harmonics. With that approach, you can, of course, do also a simulation of odd harmonics. And with a certain combination, you can just uh, create even harmonics, fundamental first harmonic, and then harmonics of that one. So these are the new waveforms, which are really new and can be adjusted properly. And then, of course, you can, with such kind of waveforms, you can also do the old kind of sawtooth, square, and triangle kind of things quite easily. So they are a byproduct of the first approach. Good. And it sounds like that. So first, let's listen to 
the harmonics and roll-off effect on sounds. Uh, I've sh shown in red the harmonics knob, in blue the roll-off knob, and they will move around now. It will start with the roll-off knob, the piece of mu music, it's pretty short, and then the harmonics are changed, and it sounds like that. It's done by Etienne Gerard, a French researcher working with us in Hamburg. The roll-off goes up. You can't do this with Butterworth filters. And now the harmonics come up. And go back. That's the basic sound of it. Well, if you do parameter modulation with these two kind of modulators, ADSR envelope based on uh, velocity and LFOs running as freely, low frequency oscillators, it will start with the modulation envelope generator and then the low frequency oscillator will start. So the first part is just the plain oscillator sound. Okay, just to give you an idea. So, and now, finally, all are combined, and it's the piece done by Etienne Gerard. So you will first see uh, roll-off moving, then harmonics moving, then modulation EG starting, and then low-frequency oscillator starting. The drums are also done with that sound, and they sound pretty amazing. You will hear it. <laughs> Roll-off goes up, now the harmonics come up. The bass gets more attack, low frequency oscillator starts. And now effects come in. get production-ready results out of that engine. That's quite good. And now a final piece, uh, which is where the sounds are done by one of the sound designers, and we have a video behind that. Uh, don't get scared. What will happen? I have to maybe do things like that. Well, the original soundscape is from Thomas Hutter. You can find his uh, website down there. And he built this soundscape. He also built 80 of the sounds uh, of that synth. And it sounds like that. That's Hamburg on the right. And that's the Northern Sea. You hear Hamburg. PC starts moving. Very nice sound now.
<laughs> okay, that's the piece. Uh, the music on that website is without that video here. Uh, it's just a still image video, but the sounds are quite nice, uh, having well, drones starting and then moving on, and finally having well a nice Sunday morning. Okay, how can we, you evaluate such kind of synth or synthesizer? Any idea? Well, companies just try to convince users. <laughs> and there are some who made comments. Uh, so the first one is uh, Barry Burns from Mokwai. Well, within five minutes, I had something. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Uh, and it was really easy to get something usable. That's what he mentioned straight away. Then Martin Ware, well, he makes a nice comment here. There's an indefinable warmth to the sound. That's true. We don't, you don't hear these sawtooths any longer, which last to 20 kilohertz. And he mentioned it reminds him on modular synths. Oh, well done, Nectar. This is maybe an older generation of people, and the new guys. Poo, techno DJs and producers, used this monster. It's nice to hear that. I'm blown away. Uh, and the other one, well, a quick session browsing factory patches has already led to ideas for five new tracks. Yes, uh, he also liked that. Okay, that's my main contribution today, showing you how signals and systems can be used for building source and filter kind of approaches. And without a deep knowledge of things there, you are lost. You will do just experimentation and will end up in buying modular synth boxes and learn what we have learned a long time ago. Uh, and the other thing which is important, without knowing modulation techniques properly, not just AM and FM, but also multi-carrier modulation is so important, and knowledge of baseband transmission. Without that, I wasn't able to create such kind of synth engine or multi-sign oscillator. Multi-sign kind of things or multi-carrier things are usually done with FFT and IFFT. This is done in time domain. So we can do everything. <laughs> in both domains, and just use the other one, which just helps to, to know how it's working. So this was also very important for me to have that knowledge. And then, of course, I've shown you how well, amp modeling is done with guitar input and amp and nonlinear modeling output. I've shown you some ideas and some results of, well, single microphone up to stereo, up to multi-channel upmix algorithms, which are, of course, very interesting also for synthesizers. I'm wondering why it's not used in synthesis engines. Well, if you need an upmix algorithm, just ask us. We know how to deal with companies. And finally, yes, uh, showing you how you can help a controller company to get a synthesis algorithm. Okay, but I can tell you, the keyboard is just one piece of controlling that one. As we know from the Defex book, you can take lots of other parameters, extract them, and control the synthesis en engine properly. Okay, I'm a little bit in out of time, but we started a little bit later. So I have to give some credits to people, and there you see how many years are involved. So in this M business, I'm working together with Stefan Möller since 20 years. So we both have, I would say, 100 years of experience with guitars. So he 50 and me 50. So we grew up with guitars in our bed and our rooms. And we grew up with amps. So two times 50 is 100. That's a nice number. The others are there. 
uh, Christian Dempwolf, he's working for Presonus right now. Martin Holtes is my chief engineer. And Felix Eichers is on the move to get a job. Uh, so, in, up, in the Upmix field, we have three persons working on it. Martin Mead, Marco Fink working for Ableton, and Sebastian Kraft now working for Nectar. For the synthesis, we had Sebastian Kraft, Etienne Gerard, he prepared these demos, which are well done and nice. And Ralf Schlünsen and Nils Larsen are the, purple from, are the people from uh, Nectar. Uh, they all four had the biggest impact onto the synthesis engine. So all credits belong to them there. And then I'm finally done at 6 o'clock after a long day with lots of duties here. <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it.